used to use the word guiding to try and help people. Over the last five years, we've decided that guiding is completely the wrong word to use when we're trying to help people understand the way we fish. Because people have turned up and they expect us to yeah, take the them lawn. to the fish and catch fish. And we can do that. But unfortunately, the places that we fish, if these people were to then try and get back there the next day, we would be responsible for their deaths. And they've actually not learned anything. All they've done is they've learned to rely on a guide. Now, you said earlier that you guided and could agree with a lot of the sentiments that you're coming out with. Because, to me, guiding isn't perhaps the right <laughs> word for us to use and perhaps not actually quite the right word for a lot of guides to use. Many guides that we know Original guides. <laughs> Many of the original guides are extremely skilled people. Some of them are in this room. And now everybody and his dog is classifying themselves as a guide if they're taking their mate down the road. I learnt this mark from this person. I'll take you to there. And of course, it's taking work away from people that put almost their lives into it. But Alan Ober, classic example. That's, that's, right, Alan. that's the smallest bass. The smallest bass caught <laughs> in 2012. And the main reason. We're all down there, same place, and even put in where I was. I think I had about 20, 20 bass that night, this sort of size. And Alan, he's standing between me and Keith. Keith had probably about 15 or 16, similar sort of size, you know, like three pound to four pound. And the main difference was we're all using the same like needle fish. Um, I think Alan had a tsunami on. He did, uh, yeah. I think I've got like a look. Um, no, it was a saltist. He had a saltist. He gave you the snorm because it's, right. it's too big and it will never work. Yeah, that's right. And, and you've got a uh, super strike on. Yes. Uh, anyway, so what it is, it's, it's an area that we've probably spread out, three of us, length of this room. Um, again, pitch black, howling the gale, and we're casting slightly up current, current's running left to right. Main difference, me and Keith cast up current, tighten up. But not tight, tight. You've just got a slight bow, and you're allowing the needle fish. And all you're doing is, as the needle fish is coming through on the current, you're, you're just keeping up just with the slack. Sure you're not moving through. the law. You are literally keeping up with the slack line, but yeah. maintaining a slight so you, bow. You, you basically, you're getting a bow so the water can actually lead the needle fish's <coughs> nose down the run, but it can still do what it wants to do. But if a bass do. sucks it towards it, it can still go. Whereas if you're retrieving and a bass comes up behind and it tries to suck in your bait, you're actually physically... This is why, years and years ago, if you were retrieving nice and slowly by using monofilament line, we would actually catch bigger fish on monofilament than what we ever did on braid. And this slide's quite interesting, because with people... Uh, does anybody know a guy called Neil McCallow? He's, he's one of the... He was originally a good... Ca it still is a very, very good caster. And he always said to me that we complicate things beyond the realms of belief and that there's too many variables to understand casting and there's too many variables to understand this. And what you should really do is you should throw away three quarters of what you think you know and concentrate on this. And I always said, well, actually, no, Neil. What we believe is that if you give a child a 100-piece jigsaw puzzle and it's too hard for the child to do, so you take away 75 pieces, it doesn't matter how many times he learns to put together those 25 pieces, he will never see the big picture. And that is where we take each variable and we've always said that no one, no individual angler can ever know anything. We do not live long enough. There is this great fear that we have that between us, we've got, what did you say, how many years about of experience? About 84, 85 years. About 85 years of experience just between me and Kevin. Now, you take all that experience that's in this room now and everybody fishes and this is this is this is like three miles out and these experiences these are sort of currents that we're, we're fishing in with the soft we, needle hard needles but mainly soft needle on there because of the amount of weed structure you've got there um, yep. and literally it's just cast in and let it drift fly rod brilliant again casting down current this is this is this is i mean that that is that is the sea there is no fresh water involved it's, these techniques work in the sea, they work in rivers, they work in estuaries, they work in waves, they work absolutely everywhere that there is moving water and everywhere there, there is bass. But what you're seeing here is the current obviously comes through into the pool. It's like, literally like salmon fishing or sea trout fishing. Anybody that's in this room that wants to learn about catching bass at night, who is a game fisherman or knows a game fisherman, pick their brains. 
and also read a book that was written by a guy called Hugh Falkus, who wrote a book called Sea Trout Fishing. Everything that is in that book is completely pertinent and relevant to the way that we fish for bass. These are the areas, so this here, this is rock on the extreme southeast coast of our island, and Seymour Tower is about a mile and a quarter out, and the Caramay is about two miles, and the Conchier looks about two and three quarter miles. But as you can see, when it all starts to get broken down into gullies and reefs, and this is where we are. We're like a speck yeah. trying to make our way back through these gullies in the, in the darkness. And in a wetsuit, floating around at about six knots. And on every, on every tide, on every wind, on every air pressure, remember, because it changes it, the bass will decide to run one way or another, depending on where the bait is. Now, this is a never snapshot from about halfway down. Now, the big arrow's there, that's running at about five knots. So you can see that depending on where we want to get in from, we will be towed a certain way through a certain set of gullies. Remember, here is four miles. And then you can see on, on the return tide, you have to come a completely different set of ways. But if you're out in this area here where the yellow arrows are, you aren't coming back. That's it. You're just not coming back. So this year, this is why those of you who watch on Facebook and they're like, Keith, why are you riding all these hundreds of miles? It's like, I want my legs to work if I get caught in those yellow arrows. Big problem, you, you hook a, a fish, even though they're only quite small in comparison to some of the stripers, you get a fish seven, eight pound. When you're in the water up to there, you're in the current that's going roughly four or five knots, sometimes higher because you're getting constricted. And you've got a bass that's pulling you one direction. You've got to swim <laughs> that direction to get a gully that's behind you to your left, and the bass wants to take you that way. You've got to kick like, like hell. It's trying, you know, and it's, you know, like that. It's, it's, it's a if you imagine, you never see that. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like Tremor is like that little yeah, section yeah, there. Yeah. So we've actually, it's like you going to Tremor and crossing across to, to you know where the field is on the other side. But going again and, and again, again, and again, again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, across all those, you know where it's heavy, and it's absolutely <coughs> bombing through, and it goes through the little gap and around all the corners. Mm. It's like you going, right, I'm going to jump in there and see where it goes. Mm. But I'm not going to take a light. I won't have a VHF radio, it's no point, because nobody can save me anyway. Oh, did I remember to leave my will on the mantle? <laughs> but it's all worth it, because when you're out there, we're catching... Yeah, best night we had. We had, we had two, no, well, two nights, and the best night between us, we had 74. In, in three hours. Three hours. And that's having to go to that extreme. If we were fishing off the shore, that a, the a good night would about. be... I mean, we had a good night. I don't know if anyone ever seen that article we did with Henry Gilby for nighttime fishing. And we had 19 bass in the dark in about the same sort of time, two and a half, three Yeah, hours. and he sat on the rocks, didn't he? And he was like, can we go home now? Can we go home now? No, Henry got to wait at least an hour. Yeah, but is it going to work? Like, Henry, look, you've come over yeah. to do this article with us. We're telling you that you've got to wait. Yeah, okay. Um, so you're not going to be bothered if I use flash. Do you think you're going to catch enough flash? Henry? <laughs> you know what I mean? Dang him wrong. Right? Henry Gilby is the... If, if any of you... If he ever phones you up and says, he wants to come and do an article with you, believe me, he's the, one of the, he's the most professional guy around the camera you could ever wish to be around. In, in, in an incredibly nice guy. But considering that he's been around so many brilliant fishermen... He must have some sort of lead shielding around his brain. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't seem to have learned anything. And it's, you know, a, a, a thoroughly nice and professional guy, though. Yeah. And it does um, make you laugh, even if you don't want to laugh for the camera. Yeah. He will call you all sorts of names oh, yeah. until you start laughing. He does. And he's, then he gets some good snapshots. This is a guy. I mean, we won't mention any names, but he's known to some of you. And he comes, and he, this guy is a security agent in places where people are shooting at you all the time. And he comes, comes skishing with us to relax. Um, this is Dave. Kane <laughs> Dave Kaneko Dave, Kitten. Known as Kaneko. Kaneko <laughs> is Japanese for kitten, so affectionately known as Kitten Dave. This guy used to stand in the water, and if it was dark, and the water used to come up beyond his knees and a piece of weed touched him, he would freak out. <laughs> Absolutely freak. To the point that you, we're talking major panic, yeah. like you needed to, you know, the, the, what they call those like EpiPen things. We, but now it's the same guy. He's going out yeah. with his dog, rolling his kayak three and a half miles out here. Like but it, but he's, he still bottles it. So the idea this year, without him knowing, is when we go skishing, I'm going to take an extendable pole, and it's like, <laughs> Dave, what was that? I just felt something, and just 
touch him on the leg and just watch <laughs> what we've been doing we've been priming him up we're channeling yeah. the sharks are coming a little bit closer into the shore so we're gonna have to be careful and what i've got is i've got a fin off the bottom of my wave skin we're going to mount it on a little bit of rope so as we're actually going along the fin will be coming like dave 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 uh, so he'll freak out